So hi everybody, I'm Milo. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, our paper uh, exploiting a natural network effect for scalable fine-grained clock synchronization. And our system is named Huygens after the famous physicist, and uh, it achieves t uh, tens of nanoseconds of accuracy in the data center. So this work is done together with Xu Yu, Zi, Balaji, Mendo at Stanford, as well as Ashish and Amin at Google. The synchronized clocks are fundamental to the operation of many distributed systems. For example, we could improve the performance and consistency of distributed databases with synchronized clocks. And we could also enforce ordering of forwarding rule, rule updates in uh, software-defined networking to avoid forwarding loops. In financial systems, we can guarantee the transaction ex execution orders. And in uh, network congestion control, we can do TDMA-style uh, flow scheduling uh, you know, to uh, mitigate congestion. And there are many other applications we can think of. So our goal here is to synchronize clocks to tens of nanoseconds in uh, real time and at scale so that we can provide accurate timestamping as a fundamental primitive in data centers. So now we take a distributed database as an example. So Spanner is Google's dis dis distributed database that supports ex external consistency at a global scale. It does this by using timestamps to order transactions. And, uh, and as a result, the read and write latency of Spanner is actually bounded by the uh, clock uncertainty, meaning the better clocks you have, the faster Spanner will be. So CockroachDB is an open source database that also uses time to achieve consistency. And the thing about it uh, is that a, a read transaction in CockroachDB has to be retried if any of the records being read is updated during this clock uncertainty interval. To see this effect, we conducted an experiment where we read 128 frequent, frequently updated records distribu distributed on 32 servers. So in the experiments, we see that when the clock uncertainty goes from one millisecond down to 10 microsecond, down, down to 100 nanoseconds, the retry possibility goes from uh, around almost uh, 100% down to almost 0%. This result shows that even, uh, I mean, the uh, nanosecond level accur uh, uh, accuracy synchronization is uh, useful even in today's existing uh, distributed uh, applications. So now the question is how to synchronize clocks. So every clock synchronization system starts from this picture. The setup is uh, the wall clock time or true time is T, and we have two servers, A and B, trying to synchronize uh, their clocks. Both, the, both servers have their clocks, and both clocks have their errors. So the two servers send probes to each other and take the transmit and receive timestamps of the probes. These four probes, uh, these four timestamps are then used to synchronize the clocks. So different uh, synchronization systems uh, are, uh, like, uh, are are mainly different in two aspects. The first is uh, where to take the timestamps, and second is how to process the timestamps. This diagram shows a simple uh, setup where the two servers are connected by a single switch. The, po the possible places where the timestamps can be taken are the CPUs, the NICs, or the FIs. Uh, it's worth noting that <coughs> the lower level, <coughs> sorry, the lower level in the stack you take the timestamps. Uh, the last noise and the variable delays will be included in the timestamps. However, uh, the more hardware support you, you will need. So for example, NTP uh, is a software-based uh, clock synchronization algorithm. It takes CPU timestamps. But since CPU timestamps include software stack latency as well as uh, network delays, NTP can be easily, easily off by uh, milliseconds. And PTP uh, is uh, the pre pre precision time protocol takes NIC timestamps. But since NIC timestamps include the uh, network queuing delays uh, happening in the queues in the switches, PTP requires uh, spe uh, specialized switches to subtract the queuing delays from the packet timestamps in order to achieve good uh, accuracy. Uh, DTP uh, made a very good observation that if you take timestamps in the files, you can avoid all the queuing delays uh, you know, uh, at one uh, directly. However, uh, to use DTP, you, you, ha you have to have all the files to be DTP, DTP compatible. 
and, uh, and, uh, and for this reason, you have to change all the hardware in your network. So where's Huygens in the picture? Huygens actually takes uh, NIC timestamps. But unlike PTP, it doesn't require specialized switches to subtract the queuing delays. Instead, it's a software-based approach, and it uses st uh, statistical methods to uh, combat network queuing delays and timestamp noise. So after uh, all the timestamps, uh, four timestamps are taken, then the synchronization boils, uh, all boils down to how the timestamps are processed to synchronize the clocks. There are mainly two approaches to this. The first approach is to treat each set of timestamp quadruples individually. For example, uh, DTP and PT PTP do this. The limitation of uh, this approach is that it's, it's uh, susceptible, susceptible to the clock running errors. For example, in the DTP paper, it uh, says that uh, the precision of DTP is bounded by 25.6 nanoseconds per hop, and uh, this number is actually four times uh, the uh, clock period in a 10G network. And across a, a six hop network, uh, you have to uh, time this uh, uh, 25.6 by six, and then you, you will get a, like a 153.6 uh, nanosecond overall accuracy uh, bound. The second approach uh, is that we can treat many sets of timestamp quadruples collectively. NTP does a little bit of this uh, by, uh, uh, by, do by doing this for multiple time uh, packets between a single pair of servers. Huygens uh, does this for uh, timestamp quad quadruples for uh, many probes and across a whole, whole, whole network of servers. By doing this, Huygens is able to go below uh, the clock running errors and is able to synchronize the clocks to tens of nanoseconds, even under very heavy network load. And uh, by synchronizing all the servers in the network as a whole, it's able to achieve a global consensus of, consensus of time. So the basic idea behind Huygens is this. Uh, so using the probe uh, sent from A to B, we know that the receive time of the probe equals to the transmit time uh, plus delay. The receive time uh, in terms of uh, true time equals, equals to the receive timestamp taken by B minus B's clock error, similarly for the transmit time. Uh, transmit time. And if we uh, rearrange the terms and put the unknowns on the left and the timestamps uh, time on the right and use the fact that the delayed term is positive, then we can get a bound on the, uh, uh, on the unknown term on the left, which is actually the uh, clock offset between the two servers using the two timestamps. Similarly, using the uh, probe from the re reverse, reverse direction, we can get a lower bound on the same quantity. And uh, so this figure is uh, got from the Google Jupyter 40G testbed. So if we plot uh, the uh, probes uh, during a two-second interval on the same figure, we got, uh, we got this. So the x-axis in, in this figure is a clock <coughs> of uh, server A. <clears throat> and the y-axis is the clock offset between the two servers. And the blue points uh, and the green points are the, are the upper bounds and lower bounds we got, we got from the probes. So the, the points are far away from the uh, cen cen uh, center area are the probes that experienced queuing delays. And the points on these boundaries are the probes experienced zero queuing delays. In theory, there shouldn't be points on the other side of the boundary. This is happening because some NICs are reporting uh, timestamps after the packets are sent, uh, sent out, meaning it's, uh, the timestamps are giving us artificially small uh, one-way one -way delays. Uh, you will see that it is import, it's critical to uh, uh, filter out these noisy data in order to achieve a good synchronization. So now, if you assume the uh, delay between the two servers are symmetric, this red line in the middle of the two boundaries will depict the clock offset between the two servers across time. For example, it says when, clock, uh, when server A's uh, time is zero, uh, server B's time is 93.3 microsecond behind it. And when server A's time is at two seconds, server B's time is 96.6 uh, microsecond behind it. We see that not only there is an offset between the two clocks, the offset, the offset is also changing over time. And in this case, the uh, clock drift is uh, uh, minus 1.65 microsecond per second. 
If we plot uh, the clock drift for many different server pairs onto the figure, uh, we got this. We see that most clock drifts uh, are within 10 microseconds per second. However, there are larger ones as large as uh, 30 microseconds per second. So this, tell, uh, this tells us that uh, we, we cannot only fix the offset between the clocks. We also have to compensate for the clock drift. Because even if the clocks are perfect, perfectly synchronized uh, at the beginning, after one second, they will be apart, uh, apart by uh, up to 30 microseconds. And 30 microseconds is uh, multiple times of the round trip time uh, in the data center. So all the previous figures uh, I showed are uh, within a two second interval. And this is what happens on a larger time scale. And in this case, it's a one minute interval. We see that the clock drift is also changing over time. This can happen when the uh, temperature of the clock changes. Uh, and for example, when the NIC is busy sending packets, it can get hot. And after it gets hot, its clock will get slower. In order to uh, deal with this problem, we, uh, what we do is, is that we chunk the time into two second uh, intervals, and we sync uh, every two second interval individually. So observation is that uh, the temperature is a phys physical uh, quantity, and it doesn't change that fast. And we have ob observed that the clock drift is uh, pr approximately a constant during two seconds. So, uh, these are, are the three key ideas we use to find the uh, right middle line, which assess about the clock offset. Uh, these are the three key ideas are support vector machine, coded probes, and the network effect. So support vector machines. So SVM uh, is a uh, machine learning a classifier developed in the 90s. Uh, and ba basically, given labeled data, SVM will uh, find a hyperplane that maxim maximally uh, separates uh, the different classes of data. So in our case, the blue and green points are two classes of data. And if we feed this data to SVM, SVM will tell us uh, where the middle line is and where the boundaries are. Using SVM alone achieves uh, uh, a synchronization accuracy of 300 to 400 nanoseconds. However, as you can see, because of the noise in this figure, the support vector machine is actually off uh, on, the, you know, on the boundary estimation. So if you think about it, uh, the only useful information in this figure are the points on the boundaries. And these are the probes that experience zero queuing delay. So the question is, is there a way that we can identify such probes, or we, we call such probes pure probes? So it's actually difficult to, uh, difficult to know if a packet has ex experienced any queuing delay or uh, timestamp noise uh, in the network. Uh, however, if you have two packets, we may have a chance. In this example, we send two packets into the network uh, with a known in, uh, gap between them. And uh, this example says 10 microseconds, but it can be whatever uh, it is uh, we measure. The 10 microsecond is only a, uh, like a like a random a example number here. So after the two packets come out of, come out of the network, uh, there are three possibilities. The first possibility is that the gap between them can become la much larger. Uh, and in this case, we know that the second packet must have been delayed more, and thus we will di uh, discard these two packets. The second exam uh, the second outcome is that uh, the gap between them becomes much smaller. And in this case, we know that the first packet must have been delayed more. And we will also di discard these two packets. And the third possible outcome is that the uh, gap between them actually comes out uh, very, close to, uh, very, very close to the uh, original uh, gap, actually within a very small guard band, uh, 50 nanosecond guard band. And in this case, it's possible that both packets experience the same queuing delay or the same time stamp noise. However, it's actually very difficult for anybody to arrange two packets to, uh, to experience the same queuing delay in the network because the queues are changing very fast. So the most likely explanation is that the both packets experienced uh, zero queuing delay and no timestamp no time noise. So that's why we will accept these uh, packets and, uh, and uh, treat them as pure probes. So if we apply the coded um, probes uh, filtering to this figure on the left, we will get the figure on the right. As you can see, it, it becomes much cleaner, and the most of the uh, you know, bad data uh, are removed, and most of the pure probes are preserved. 
Empirically, coded probes filter out 90% of bad data and reduce the clock sync error by a factor of four. So up to now, we have synchronized uh, two clocks. After they are synchronized, they have a mutual agreement on their clock offset and drift, but they can do no better. It's possible that uh, there are random noise uh, during uh, two second, uh, random estimation errors within this two, two second interval, or there can be a sy systematic error uh, caused by uh, path asymmetry. For example, if the delay between uh, from A to B is uh, one microsecond and the delay from B to A is three microseconds, then there will be a one microsecond uh, asymmetry, uh, a one, one microsecond uh, uh, systematic error caused by this asymmetry. However, uh, within these two nodes, there's no way to know there, there, are, there are such errors, uh, and, uh, and this is already what, what they can do best. Uh, however, if you have a dirt clock in the picture, we can do much more. Uh, for example, since A and B are synchronized, A can say, if my clock is at 10, B's clock must be at 10.15. Uh, then B can say, if my clock is at 10.15, uh, C's clock is at, uh, must be at 10.05. Uh, then since C and A are also synchronized, C can say, if my clock is at 10.05, A's clock might, must be at uh, 9.50. Then going through, through the loop, uh, clock, uh, the A's clock uh, be, uh, begins at 10 and ends at uh, 9.50 and we find uh, there is a 10 minute error on the loop. Then the question is how do we distrib uh, attribute the errors on the edges? It could be 2 to 6 or it could be uh, minus 10, uh, 5, 15. And without an any prior, prior knowledge, the only thing we can do is to evenly distribute the errors on, on the edges. Ho however, this may not be the right thing to do. So what we do is uh, actually uh, in, the, in the cluster, each server in, the, in, in our system probes uh, k other servers. And thus, uh, using all the probing pairs, uh, we form a, a, a quite dense uh, synchronization network, and there are many loops in this network. And then combining the information in all the loops, uh, we can qu quite much uh, accurately attribute the errors on, onto the different edges. This figure shows uh, how the density of this synchronization uh, network helps. The x-axis is the number of servers each server probes, and the y-axis is the synchronization error. As you can see, as each server probes more and more other servers, uh, the synchronization error drops down dramatically, and especially for the high percentile error. And in fact, we know that theoretically, uh, the, uh, the standard deviation of the edge errors after the network effect is a constant factor of it, of the standard deviation of the edge errors uh, before the network effect. And uh, uh, so we will uh, like skip the proof here in the pre presentation. So the implementation of high density is like this. So as, uh, as I uh, introduced, uh, so each server probes k other servers. k is a number from 10 to 20, uh, and it doesn't change uh, with the size of the network. So uh, Huygens scales with the size, of not, not very, not, uh, the size of the network very well. And the overall uh, probing bandwidth is uh, on the level of five um, um, megabits per second. And with all the probes, uh, we form a synchronization network. And then we run the coded probes and support vector machines uh, in place on the all different servers. And after this step is done, uh, the results of the support vector machine, uh, which are just the three numbers, uh, two numbers actually, the uh, drift and the offset of the middle line, will be collected by a master server, and then the master server will run the network effect and, uh, uh, and uh, compute a consensus of the, of the time, and then distribute the uh, result to all other servers. So we have deployed Huygens uh, in a Google uh, uh, 40G testbed with three layers of networks and also a Google production system with five stages of networking. We also built ourselves a test by at Stanford uh, with uh, 1G servers and switches, and it's a two-layer uh, uh, test bed, a two-layer network with 128 servers. In order to verify the accuracy of Huygens, we used FPGAs. The idea is that uh, there are four ports on a single FPGA, which can uh, act as four uh, independent NICs. However, these four NICs share the same clock. We will first use Huygens to uh, give an estimate of the clock offset between these uh, FPGA ports, 
And then since we know that the ground truth clock offset is zero, any uh, clock offset uh, uh, declared by Huygens, we know that is an error. So in fact, we have three FPGAs in the, in the test bed. And uh, we use uh, copper jumper cables to connect their I.O. pins. And uh, these, uh, and these channel will serve, serve as a, a second channel for us to get the clock offset ground truth. And then we will compare the Huygens uh, result with this ground, ground truth uh, to see, uh, to know what the Huygens accuracy is. And this table shows the results. The experiment is run at 40% load with k equals to 10. As we can see, uh, the 99th percentile error before network effect is uh, already within 100 nanosecond, and after uh, and after the network effect, it becomes uh, 30 nanoseconds. And this figure shows the uh, uh, how uh, Huygens is robust to load. The x-axis is load, y-axis is error, and we can see that even at 90 percent load, Huygens uh, achieves a 99 percentile error within uh, five, uh, 50 uh, nanoseconds. And this figure shows uh, the comparison between NTP and Huygens. And for uh, fairness, we used a hard, uh, hardware timestamp uh, for NTP2. As you can see, at medium to high load, uh, Huygens' uh, error is uh, four orders of magn magnitude smaller than uh, NTP's. So in conclusion, uh, Huygens synchronizes clocks to within tens of nanoseconds and enables accurate timestamping as a primitive service in data centers. It's a software-based end-to-end system, and it's lightweight and scalable. So the three key ideas are SVMs, coded probes, and the network effect. And since Huygens only requires hardware timestamping capability, which most current generation NICs support, it's ready for deployment for, uh, in current data centers. Thank you. Any questions? Coming up for a question. Hi, I'm uh, Jeremy Elson from Google. Uh, this is nice work. I like it. Um, I have a couple questions. I'll just pick one. Um, the first is, uh, you said you use five megabits per second for probes. Is that aggregate across the entire test bed or just between each pair of, uh, of machines that we're participating? That's uh, the aggregate uh, bandwidth overhead for one server. For so one, okay. So each server is uh, five megabits per second. So um, that's orders of magnitude more than uh, other synchronization yeah, protocols depending use? On, so. Depending on how many, uh, like the K, right? So it's an order of magnitude, yes. So if K were one, I, I guess the core of the question I'm asking is if you turn down the, the probing rate uh -huh. to something that was comparable to NTP, or equivalently, if you were to turn up NTP's probing rate mm -hmm. to be comparable to Huygens. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder how that would change because m more data always helps because a lot of the errors are um, are, are Gaussian and so the more probes you have, the the, the more error you can cancel out. Uh, and NTP limits itself usually to one probe, you know, per minute or something, uh, mm -hmm. which is which, which is many orders of magnitude less than what you're using. So I'm curious how the how the two would compare if if the bandwidths were equivalent. So NTP would definitely uh, improve a little bit with more probes. But then the, the, the thing is, uh, in, uh, the NTPs uh, was uh, like a prim primarily designed for uh, wide area networks, so it doesn't use the fact uh, that uh, you can actually figure out the minimum uh, round trip time, you know, within a data center. Like if it doesn't consider the fact that many probes actually experience no queuing delay in the network, right? And, and uh, as a result, uh, uh, you know, the algorithm used by NTP. Uh, will be, uh, you know, heavily influenced by the network queuing delays, even though it, you know, it's using you know, many more probes than it's currently using. Okay, it, it does have similar filtering that it, it takes sort of the, the minimum RTT to, to to assume to be the one that that's experiencing the least queuing delay. So that the yeah, more probes the, you send, the, the better that'll work. Yeah, the minimum RTT is uh, is uh, like a susceptible to, uh, to the you know NIC timestamp noise because the NIC timestamp the, the, the way the NICs are taking timestamps some, sometimes you can get artificially small. Uh, RTTs, and then, then like this will, you know, fold into the uh, error in the NTP. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We'll take one more question while more it sets up. Thank you. Hi, this is really cool work. I'm Rodrigo from Brown University. Uh, two quick questions. Um, one is, have you? These are really cool techniques. Have you tried to use these for the wide area? I know, like, you won't get any the same performance uh, or yeah. same precision, but it's 
you could. The second question is kind of crazy. Uh, have you tried to use this uh, to measure the temperature in the data center? <laughs> uh, so yes to both questions. Uh, for the for the first question, we actually uh, uh, run we, we have run uh, Huygens uh, in a cloud lab. It's like there are three sites uh, in uh, uh, Utah, Wisconsin, and uh, Clemson, and we are achieving like a, uh, under 10 microsecond accuracy uh, like uh, across uh, the continent. And for the second question, yes, we and that's uh, actually uh, like a, a very important application of this. Of this, and uh, yeah. All right. Let's thank you long again.